Hi, I'm Whitney. And I'm Camden. Welcome to Ghosts and Garnets, Murder in Idaho. Halloween spooktacular this special is episode. Halloween, this is Halloween. <laughs> Halloween, Halloween. Oh, there's my singing debut. Guys, we love spooky season. So we love it. Much. So much. My yeah, my entire house is covered in giant black spiders outside. I have like a hundred foot spider web coming off my front balcony and I've got spiders everywhere and it is a creepy AF. And I will have you know that Camden owns more skeletons than any reasonable person should. This is true. Life size. And Life also size, real skeletons. Then we have like a, what would you call it? A herd of wolf skeletons and a pack of cats. <laughs> I have flamingo skeletons Ooh, in my same. front yard currently. Yeah. I know that yeah. they don't have Love. skeletons, but I want the octopus. Just saying. Ooh, I didn't know there was an octopus. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's silly because, you know, they don't have skeletons per se, but I'm yeah. here for it anyway. Yeah, I'm here for it too. I w you, ooh, you know what I would like? I would like a skeleton llama ooh. or an alpaca. Ooh. Yes. yes. All right, well, guys, we decided that we were going to put out a special Halloween extra episode for you because we love you so much, and this is a great way to celebrate the spook. And this is coming out on Halloween, so happy Halloween. Happy Halloween! <laughs> so today we are going to be talking about all creepy unsettling Creepy. yeah all disturbing. of these stories are from pocatello area pocatello idaho as my siri likes to say pocatello <laughs> that's how she says it i am not kidding you i had to go to pocatello for a conference once and i said hey siri how far am i from pocatello and she said as the crow flies <laughs> You are one hour from Pakatala. <laughs> I'm literally crying. <laughs> <Can see. laughs> but it's true. I shit you not. I am, I can't even make that up. So, <laughs> you know, I don't generally fuck with Siri or Alexa, frankly, but I, maybe I should just for that. Well, this was years ago. Maybe she's upgraded, but God. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I might not recover. Uh. <laughs> Let's go, uh, woman. I'm hilarious. Get used to it. Oh, <laughs> uh, good grief. So, <laughs> for any non-Idahoans or people that care not where Pocatello is normally in their lives, it is in the southeastern region of Idaho, fairly close to the Utah border, actually. And it is the hometown of my mother. Nancy! Nancy, who we will talk about a little later, because she's very unhelpful when it comes to uh, remembering hauntings of any kind. This sounds very her, but be nice to her. She's our favorite. Well, she's my favorite, too, but she is not good with the remembering of things. <laughs> <laughs> so you, well, neither so. are you. You thought we part partied at the murder house, so let's Listen, be clear. we could have. Let's be clear. Maybe you don't remember. Listen. Maybe you blocked it out because of the ice fingers. Well, then maybe we know. should go undergo a hypnotizing. Yeah, I don't know if I believe in getting hypnotized. I don't <sighs> know if that that's really happens. Okay, we'll all go. You can watch. We'll see what happens. Sold. Okay. Pocatello is supposed to be, apparently, which I did not know this before we started researching, supposed to be one of the most haunted towns in America, which is wild because... It doesn't boast a lot of other things. Right. You know? It's not really beautiful. I mean, it's not like a, it's not a great big city. Mm -mm. It doesn't have like something, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's because it's like, well, do you there think, are a lot of. I'm sorry. I did not mean to interrupt no, you. No, go ahead. Well, the, the Native American. I mean, oh, I think. Absolutely. You know, that's. No, I think a ton of it has to do with all of the horrors surrounding the indigenous tribes. Right. Yeah. I think absolutely that has a lot to do with it. And we'll get into a little bit of that too. And I'm really bummed out because every year Pocatello does a ghost tour. And I found out too late, too late in the game for us to do it this year, but we have to do it next year for because sure. it goes through some of the things that we're going to talk about today. 
and I think it sounds really, really cool. And the author of this book that I'm going to talk about a little later, it's actually called Ghosts of Pocatello, Haunted History from the Gate City by John Bryan. I don't know why Pocatello is called the Gate City, but it has some creepy ass stories in this book. And this guy is from Pocatello and he spent like years researching all this stuff and then putting it together. And he's part of that haunted tour that I was just talking about. So if you were interested in haunted things in Pocatello, you should get this book because Cam and I both read it and it was quite spooky. It was spooky. Let's get into it then. Yeah. So the first story we have is not from the book, but it is about some of the indigenous tribes that were in Pocatello. The Shoshone and Bannock tribes had lived in the area that is now southeast Idaho for many years. They depended on their hunting grounds to feed the tribe. In the late 1840s and 1850s, Emigrant. Emigrant, yeah. Emigrant. Yeah. I say like the pioneers or the massive amounts of followers of Brigham Young or the Oh, gold, you mean the, the tribe. The that gold you're now seekers. In. <laughs> the tribe now that's sending me <laughs> mass emails. Okay, yes. so the pilgrims wagon trains increasingly <laughs> crossed their territory, which put strain on food and water resources, driving off their hunting grounds and disrupted their way of life. Chief Pocatello And the Shoshone tribe began a series of raids that culminated in the Bear River Massacre, in which 200 to 350 reports are differing on this indigenous people were slaughtered, making it the bloodiest and most deadly slaying of Native Americans by the U.S. military, according to historians and tribal leaders. This led Chief Pocatello to agree to bring his people to the Fort Hall Reservation, where the land was unfit for farming and his people would continue to starve for years to come. This was known as the Great Famine. So we could have done a whole a whole episode on this. We could we could do a whole series on this. I when we first started we were just gonna do an episode about this particular legend. I think we had like four or five pages already of just the history of the area. Uh, between the U.S. military and the Shoshone and Bannock people before we decided that we were going to switch it up. But I, for sure, I think one day we should do just like a whole series on all of the horrific shit that white people did to the indigenous people of Agree. this area. So the legend that we're going to talk about of the water babies kind of came about because of this this great famine. The legend of the water babies has been around since the mid-1800s. According to the legend, there was once a great famine that was decimating the Shoshone tribe. They were starving and could not feed their children. So mothers were forced to drown their newborn babies in the local rivers and lakes rather than watch them starve to death. Horrifying. Horrifying. Taking the form of a human infant, the water baby is a mysterious and deadly spirit that haunts rivers and lakes in southeast Idaho. It is said that the spirits of the babies grew tails, fins, and gills, surviving by feeding on tadpoles and small fish. The water babies mimic the crying and laughter of a human baby in order to allure unsuspecting humans to the water's edge. The personality of the water babies can can vary. Sometimes it is characterized as mischievous and enjoys teasing and abusing any human that approaches the water's edge. Other stories say water babies are murderers who are seeking revenge for their deaths. The water babies are said to be seen playing in the waters around the Shoshone Bannock Reservation. Their laughter can be heard and is said to be used to lure people to their death. Nowadays, the water babies are a continuing legend. If you go to the banks of this river and sit for a while in silence, you will hear the sound of babies crying. It is supposed to be the spirits of those same babies looking for their mothers. So, horrifying. <sighs> it's horrifying. And this one, you know, it is spooky because, I mean, can you imagine hearing that crying from the river? But it's no, devastating. It's, like it's kind of a sad one. It is sad. But you know what? I've got to tell you, I am... I am here for the idea of a vengeful baby. Yeah. (laughs) You know, are you? If I was, yes. Like, I really like the idea of a vengeful baby. See, (laughs) I don't. (laughs) I feel like it. Do you remember Allie McBeal? Okay, this is going to date me because I'm basically 100 now. No, 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 no. Oh, God. Right? The dancing baby. I can't. Yes. No, it's too much. So what I... Yeah, I, put fins on that dancing baby. I gross. <laughs> I I can see vengeful mothers. 
that had to do this to their babies. That's a, a legend yeah. I can get behind. You know it's really creepy, and I will post it on the socials, some of the depictions of these water babies. <sighs> so scary. Now, I have to admit, so I didn't scary. look these up, so I'm interested. Oh my gosh, well, I'll posted. post them because they're terrifying. <laughs> well, maybe they'll make me a, a, a supporter, I guess, of the vengeful water baby. I don't know. I just like the idea of an angry baby, I guess. I shouldn't because I had an angry baby and it was terrible. Pretty miserable. Mm. Yeah. She's not angry now, though. She's fairly, fairly enjoyable. All right. So our next story, we are going to talk about Pocatello High School. And my mother went to Pokey High. She and her best friend, Rita. And I asked both of them if they remembered anything about like something being scary or people talking about it or legends or, you know, any kind of like encounter that they had that was scary. And both of them were utterly useless to me. (laughs) (laughs) They did not remember a thing. And for my mother, it's not terribly surprising because one, she has a horrible memory. And two, she's not like super aware of things that are going on outside of her like mm-hmm. immediate bubble, mm-hmm, right? you know? And when I told her she was unhelpful, she said, and this is a direct quote, and if there has ever been a sentence that better encompasses my mother, I have yet to hear it. She said, Whitney, I was not a ghost, so I did not care. <laughs> Stop it. I swear. <laughs> it was not a ghost, that, so I did not care. Okay, that does sound like your mother. <laughs> but also, <laughs> it sounds like you. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know what you want from me here. <laughs> you know, it's so funny is that I told Robin that story today, and she said, it sounds like something you would say. There, there you go. <laughs> I'm not wrong. Proven right. Well... I, I can tell you this right now, like probably Boise High, where we went to high school, is haunted. And I did not pay attention to the living or the dead. They were outside of my immediate vicinity. Right. I don't so. remember stories about that, about Boise High, though. So I'm going to look that up when I we get done. Either, but and there, there had to be. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fucking old. Mm-hmm. So there's so many legends about Pokey High. I read a whole bunch of stuff about it, and then I watched um, a Ghost Hunters episode this morning where they covered Pokey High. And if you want to have, like, your spooky bubble burst, watch this episode. No, absolutely Because not. it was, it really bummed me out. So some of the things that they were investigating, because the principal of Pocatello High School actually called these guys in okay. because there's so many urban legends and she's had employees have actual like encounters with stuff before. So there were a few things she was going to have them check out. There are stories of like toilets in the basement flushing by themselves, lights and elevators going totally wonky all by themselves, lots of haywire electrical stuff. There's a story about this heartbreaking librarian who got left at the altar and then hung herself from a chandelier in the library. And ghost hunters, don't watch it if you, if you, you know, want to continue to believe all of these things that are fun and spooky. But there were a few things they did find in this auditorium where they do school plays and that kind of stuff. There was a definite presence in the auditorium and in the auditorium and the gymnasium, there was like an energy leech whenever they did anything in the room and like all the energy was sucked out of all of their devices, which apparently is a sign. I'm not a ghost hunter, so I don't know these things. But they did say that there was definitely like a spirit, but they didn't think the spirit was an asshole. They thought the spirit was like a friendly ghost. So that's funny because when I was reading that book, that's where Mr. Funny Bones would always end up. Shut the behind fuck. the auditorium. <laughs> no. Yes. And the story was called Mr. Funny Bones. And the science teacher, I believe, or the health teacher had a real human skeleton, which they don't do that anymore. But he had a real human skeleton and the bones kept going missing different parts of it and every single time it was found on the stage behind the auditorium (gasps) every time he kept locking it he put tape so that he could tell if it had been opened the door or whatever he put this closet whatever he put the the skeleton in and Uh he said all right mr bones if you're real you get out 
on Halloween. Well, then Halloween, he goes to check the closet. The skeleton is in there without its head. And let <gasps> me tell you Shut up. where he found him. In the auditorium. So he says to him, to Mr. Bones, all right, I believe you, you're real. But like, listen, man, can you just, I mean, you might need to get out sometimes, but can you just stay put for most of the time? And he said mostly he hasn't really had anything happen anymore. This is a pokey high? Yes. I know. I didn't even, did not come across any of this. I probably should have finished that book, but I stopped reading it after that one story. Because well, it's I mean, there's two me of so us. We, we'll figure it out. Figure it out together. Yes. I am going to tell you a story from that book about Pokey High. A little history, Pocatello High School was built in 1892. And then in 1914, there was a fire in the boiler room and it burned the school to the ground. So it was rebuilt um, and it opened its doors back up to students three years later in 1917. Since then, it's had additions and remodels and stuff. So there's a part of the school that's much older than the rest of the school, but it is still open. So this is from the Creepy Pocatello book that we were talking about. So on a rainy Thanksgiving morning, a custodian named Grant went to work at Pocatello High School to finish some of the tasks he was an unable to finish from the night before because he had to leave to meet his family before he was done. So he was alone in the school, which usually didn't bother him very much, even though he had heard all of the urban legends about the school. He'd worked there for a while and hadn't had anything scary happen. So usually it didn't bother him. But Today, he was apprehensive because the last thing he had to do was clean the trophy room, which was in the oldest part of the school. And inside the trophy room, there is a doorway that leads to a staircase down to this old uh, gymnasium which isn't used anymore. And he didn't like going in there. He felt it had like a creepy presence. It just wasn't his, wasn't his jam, but he had to clean it. So he went in and started mopping the floor and he felt another presence in the room. He turned around and saw a boy standing in the doorway. The boy was dripping wet. He looked cold and confused and Grant felt the atmosphere change in the room. He asked the boy what he was doing in the building, and the boy responded, I came in out of the rain. Grant asked him how he had gotten into the locked building, and the boy again said, No, I just came in out of the rain. It looked like the boy was struggling to speak and that it was painful for him to get the words out. Grant told him to hold on so he could put his mop away and he looked away for a moment. And when he turned back around, the boy was gone. So he went out to the hallway where the doorway was the boy had been standing in and there was no one in the hallway at all. And there's no way anybody could have gone out. There wasn't another door that led anywhere. So Grant was super freaked out as one would be. And he ran out of the school and did not return ever. Same Grant. Same. Yeah. This story had more to it before I watched the Ghost Hunters episode. (laughs) Oh, Ghost hunters, boo. And they really put a kink in my story plans. But there was a boy who died in the pool. There was never a pool in the school. So much rhyming. I know. Really? Yeah. That is... So that's surprising to me because in this guy's book, there is a pool in the school that has been covered over by the gymnasium floor because someone drowned in the pool. Well... These fucking ghost hunters go to the town historical dude who's like a billion years old and also used to work at Pokey High. And he says, no, no, he's seen all of the plans for the school. There was never a pool. So no one ever drowned. He also said that the chandelier in the library was put in in 1973. And he worked there from 1970 to 1991, and nobody ever hung themselves there. See what I mean about a bummer? Yeah, I'm over Don't watch the show. It's a bummer. Don't ever watch it again, Whitney. Tell me. Believe me, I never will, because I'm already on the paranormal fence for the most part, and 
it bummed me out. So I can imagine people who were like fully invested in the paranormal would be very irritated by the show. Also, it wasn't very entertaining. It was a good story. So we could it was a good story. story alive. You just bummed me out a little bit. I'm telling you, it was not good. The one that I have is of a true ghost. A real ghost. <gasps> okay, good. And I haven't seen this story. I have not read it. You're going to get some solid reactions out of me. It's called The Girl in the Park. Sally and Tim were brother and sister. Tim was two years older than his sister and had taken it upon himself to be her protector. Sally thought Tim was the best big brother ever and would follow him everywhere. The older residents in their neighborhood always commented that you never saw Tim without Sally or Sally without Tim. They were not like most siblings their age. They did not fight, squabble with each other. They loved being together and hated to be apart. It was Saturday afternoon in April when Sally and Tim headed out the door of their red brick house. Winters in Idaho seemed to last forever, with snow and cold temperatures lasting far into the spring months. Being children with very little patience for the weather, Sally and Tim sprinted outside to spend the evening in the neighborhood park. This park is called Ammon Park, and it's obviously a park in Pocatello. The day was barely 60 degrees, but warm enough compared to the long winter that had just ended. Playing in the park was a common practice for all of the neighborhood children. Tim and Sally, like all of the other area children, loved to spend every moment outside running and playing together in Ammon Park. On one side of the park, there was a large, grassy field where the children could run or play tag. On the other side of the park was a gray metal swing set with four wide seats. And next to the swings was a slide that was so high off the ground, many children would get scared just climbing on the top and would have to climb back down the ladder for fear of falling. On this particular day, Sally and Tim ran to the park to catch up with the other kids who were already there playing. They rushed past the utility shed. The door was open, apparently left open by one of the park caretakers. Sally glanced at Tim with a questioning look, but quickly forgot as her attention turned to catching up with the rambunctious group of youngsters. Little did they know, this shed would change everything they thought and believed about that park. The day wore on, and the children began returning to their homes for dinner. Most would return to the park after their meal as long as the weather stayed warm. It was not long before Sally and Tim found themselves alone on the swings. They had spent many evenings alone in the park, and this one was much like the others. The siblings were enjoying the peaceful evening together and began chatting about stories they had heard about the park. One was about the girl who was said to appear at dusk. She was described as a young girl with brown, shoulder-length hair and always wore a light blue dress. One of the other children had told them that he had seen the girl late at night swinging all alone. He thought she looked lonely and she wanted the children to come back to play with her. Tim didn't believe any of the stories and told Sally he believed they were made up by the older kids to scare the younger ones. As the children sat on the swings and talked, they began to get a feeling as though they were being watched from someone or something in the bushes. Sally looked over her shoulder, thinking she would see one of the other kids returning to the park, but when she looked... No one was there. Sally told her brother she didn't want to talk about the girl anymore, and the two children decided to go home. On their way home, Tim remembered the open shed door at the edge of the park. He and Sally walked over to the shed to look inside. It smelled like gasoline from a lawnmower stored in the back of the shed, and lawn clippings were scattered all over the floor. Come on, Sally. Let's go inside and check it out, Tim teased as he entered the doorway. I don't want to. Can't we just go home, Sally begged? It's cold and dark in there. Plus, we could get in trouble if someone catches us in there. Tim did not hesitate and entered the shed. Not wanting to be left alone in the dark, Sally reluctantly followed behind. As the children reached the back of the shed door, it slammed shut. Suddenly, they were completely submerged in darkness. Nope. (laughs) Tim found his way back to the door, but found it was locked tight. Tim, get me out of here, cried Sally. I can't. The door is locked. Tim responded remorsefully. We have to pound on the door so someone will hear us and let us out. They pushed with all of their strength, trying to open the door, but it did not budge. The two children pounded and yelled, trying to alert someone to their predicament, but after an hour, they realized no one was coming. The shed began to get cold, and Tim and Sally huddled together in the corner, trying to stay warm. Tim hoped their mother would notice they were missing and come to the park looking for them. After what seemed like hours, Sally heard a soft scratching sound coming from outside. 
It started on the side of the shed, but slowly moved to the front. Soon, the noise was on the shed door, as if someone was outside scratching their name into the wood. Tim called out, Is someone out there? We are locked inside the shed. Could you please help us get out? The scratching suddenly stopped, and the door popped open. Tim grabbed Sally's hand and quickly pushed the door wide open. The sky was dark and the stars were out. The chill of the night stung the children's skin as they walked into the grass. Tim looked around for the person who had opened the door, but the park was deserted. Not being able to see anyone, Tim turned to Sally and said, I don't know what happened, but we are out. Are you okay? I'm okay, Sally spoke with a quiet voice. I know who let us out. Tim watched as Sally pointed across the park to the old swing set. In the darkness, a small figure wearing a blue dress could be seen swinging back and forth as she glowed in the obscurity. Tim and Sally quickly turned and hurried home. The brother and sister returned to the park often, always looking for the girl in blue. I do not enjoy scratching. I don't enjoy it. I have no interest in it. I don't want to hear it. You better knock that off. (laughs) Ooh, it's even better with that. I should have done that in the middle. Yeah, you should have. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a ghost? No. No. I don't think so. I thought I heard a ghost at your parents' house when we were growing up because your parents' house was so old and it had crazy sounds. Um, And I always thought there was a ghost in your basement because I fucking hate basements. (laughs) Uh, And I hated going down there with you. I always felt like something was like directly around the corner. Same. Same. I did too. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, my house now, there's a ghost in it. Really? Yes. It's tall and abnormally tall. And it's like just like brawny or like scrawny, scrawny and tall, but it's like a black blur, like a shadow. Yeah, but dark. And it's standing. It's Oof. not like against a wall or something. And no. I always just see him out of the corner mm-hmm. of my eye. Don't enjoy. It. And uh, what's interesting is, as we started to remodel and add on, yeah, you, we never see it in any of the places that we've remodeled. Only in the original parts of the house. And really, Jacob has seen it too. So. <gasps> I know. Maybe it's just Jacob's shadow. He's in the room He's with me. Or not here at all, you bozo. all right. He's very tall and thin. <laughs> no. <laughs> Stop it right now. Listeners, she's a liar. Well. Anyway, that's my That's I don't I don't like it. What, you don't I, like I my don't ghost like or you that. don't like the girl? I don't like that you have a ghost. And I don't like that I was once in that house many years ago because you guys, Camden abandoned me 20 years ago and moved four hours north for a boy. And I think the last time I was in her house was like many years ago, maybe at your wedding. Yes. Yeah. Guys, this story that I'm about to tell you, it's from the book. I got through about half of it and had to put the book down and physically walk away because I was so uncomfortable. Talking about how I'm going to read the story to you is making me anxious. I'm getting anxiety. (laughs) And I am not a spooky story person generally. Like I don't get freaked out by, you know, ghost stories or campfire stories or whatever. This, I'm going to tell you right now, is going to scare the bejesus out of you. So. And even better, Post the pictures that go along with this story from that room. Oh, I'm going to post pictures of all of this stuff. This thing, this is so fucked up. I'm just going to read it, but it is terrifying. I am terrified. Tell me. Read it. (sighs) Okay. So, this story in the book is called The Face of of the devil. Now, the original Pocatello Hospital was on Center Street downtown. And there was a warehouse that's now called the Amerigo Warehouse. And that was down the street from the hospital. And it was originally a dairy processing plant in the 1900s. A few years later, the dairy had gone out of business and the freezer within the warehouse was used as the morgue. Uh, for the city of Pocatello while a new hospital was being built. Sorry, I'm mentally preparing myself. (laughs) 
so excited. All right. So there were stories of a doctor who worked in the morgue and did horrible things at night. This urban legend said he would use tunnels under the warehouse to secretly bring victims into the building unseen where he would perform experiments on them. On the walls of this freezer in the warehouse were patches of brown stains that formed the outline of bloody handprints, and there are photographs. In the far corner of the basement was a small dark room that had a heavy feeling of despair. The room was featureless, with gray concrete walls and a single light bulb dangling from the ceiling. In the top center of the outside wall was a black mark, which could be seen as one walked into the room. At first, you could mistake it as a simple black patch on the wall. But if you looked closer, the features became very apparent. The black mark clearly formed a dark face with hollow eyes and a gaping mouth. The foreboding expression filled the room with dread and seemed to absorb the light like a black hole. The rumors allege that these marks came from the victims of the doctor. Now, the owners of the building had tried everything to get the stains to go away over the years, even using acid to burn them off the wall. But eventually, they always came back. The owners of the building attempted to eradicate the black mark by covering it with paint. The paint worked for a few weeks, but as the days passed, the face returned until it was as solid as it had been before. (sighs) Fuck off, face. (laughs) This is where we're going to get to our story. Now that you got a little background. So, a man named Joe worked at the warehouse on First Street in Pocatello. He unloaded trucks and he worked in the warehouse sort of organizing equipment and he moved stuff from the yard inside and back and forth. He had worked there for a long time, but the only thing he didn't like about his job was working in the basement. That's because basements are portals to hell, Joe. The basement at the warehouse was made up of several different rooms and a large freezer. The freezer no longer worked, but it was too big to move, so it had stayed. Now, mid-October was a busy time of year for Joe. He spent a lot of his time filling the building with equipment that needed to be stored for winter. By the end of October, snow could begin to fall, so he spent a long hours every day bringing in different pieces of equipment and getting them ready for storage. The top half of the building was always first to be filled, but as it got later into October, it was clear that some items would have to be taken to the basement. One morning, Joe arrived at work. He knew it was going to be a busy day because a full trailer was coming in and he would be lucky to be done before dark. The first half of his day was normal, but as evening approached, the main floor became full and the rest of the equipment would have to be taken to the basement. His co-worker Terry had stayed until five, but had to leave because it was his son's birthday, so Joe was left to finish alone. He worked quickly, wrapping each piece of equipment in plastic and then walking it down the steep stairs and placing it in the back corner. Joe didn't waste any time in the basement and made sure he left as fast as he could. By the time he wrapped the last item in plastic, the sun had set. The basement was dark, even with the lights on. Joe quickly walked down the stairs, anxious to finish the job. He placed the last item at the back of the room and headed for the stairs. As Joe raced for the stairs, he could see that the doors were all closed on all three small rooms at the front of the basement, so he wasn't going to have to stop and close them. As he neared the stairs, he saw a figure in the corner of his eye. With a rush of terror, he turned and faced the open door. Of the freezer. Standing in front of him was a pale, blonde haired girl. The white cotton dress she wore highlighted her shining blue eyes, and she stared at him with a blank expression. Joe bent over as he struggled to regain his breath, 
and after a moment he began to speak. He faced the little girl and said, You almost gave me a heart attack. What are you doing down here? The little girl did not respond. She simply stood motionless with the same blank expression on her face. Joe paused for her response, but when she remained silent, he angrily snapped. Did you hear me? How long have you been down here? The girl became visibly agitated. Her blue eyes turned gray as they focused on his face. The girl began to move her mouth as a small, cold whisper escaped her lips. Her voice was soft, but he understood what she said. I have always been here. (laughs) Suddenly, the doors on all three rooms began to open and close wildly. The loud slam startled Joe, and he turned around towards them. He looked at the doors again only for a moment and returned his gaze to the empty freezer. She had vanished. The doors abruptly stopped slamming shut, and for a brief moment, everything was still. He stood paralyzed with fear. The freezer was about 50 feet long and had a large door at both ends. He watched with horror as the door at the opposite end of the freezer opened slowly. As the door swung open, something came through the entrance. It was a hooded figure, dressed in a white uniform, stained with red splotches of blood, walking into the room. The head was covered with a hood, which had a long, protruding beak and two inlaid goggles. He wore blood-stained gloves, which had a knife in one hand and an old-style syringe in the other. Joe realized this was the doctor. He struggled to comprehend what was happening. When the bloody figure began to move toward him, Joe was thrust back into this terrifying reality. He turned with a single motion and ran up the stairs, away from the building, into his truck, and sped away. The next morning, his co-worker got to work, only to find that the building was open and all the lights were on. He tried to call Joe, but couldn't get him to answer. So he went to Joe's house after a few days. Joe refused to go back to work and said he would never go into the building again. Terry offered Joe a position on the road crew. He accepted on two conditions. First, that Terry would never make fun of him again for being afraid of the basement. And second, that all the doors in the basement would be removed. To this day, Joe can be seen working on road projects around town, and not a single door is left in the basement of the warehouse. That's intense. No, I'm telling you. Those old school doctor beak. masks that they wore with the fucking beak and the goggles. The worst. There is nothing scarier. No. There is nothing scarier. That is what in nightmares a basement are made of. That is what nightmares are made of. I'm telling you. Like, I could not even finish <laughs> the story the first time around. I heard I read beak and I was like, nope. And I just walked away. I could I could not. <laughs> oh. God. Well, I read the story just... and I thought it was creepy, but yeah. the way that you just told it was much creepier, way better. So, bravo. Thank you. It scared the pants off me. <laughs> Places that have these like very kind of creepy histories, like, you know, you have occasional buildings sometime in towns, but in where there's an entire town that has so many hauntings and urban legends that there's actual like ghost walks because there's so many places that have weird things happening in them. That's disturbing. It is disturbing. And we're going to be so disturbed when we go do our ghost walk next month. We're going to do it in, um, in Lewiston, which is a different town. Different, different town, but 
yes, we are going to ghost walk, which we're very excited so about. Excited. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think um, the thing that kills me about this story is that when I was reading it, I'm like this freezer that was, they were using as the morgue while that hospital yeah. was being built. And I'm thinking, I just couldn't visualize it. And then, I, you know, here I come to turn the page and here is this yeah. huge, I mean, the freezer is the size of a room. It was huge. Oh yeah. No. I mean, it's so big. They couldn't get it out of the basement. Right. It almost looked like it was built into it the was basement. right. It was a dairy processing plant. So they, when they built the building, they built the freezer in the building. No thanks. Yeah, no. Thank Seems you. terrible. I, Poor Joe. Mm-hmm. Poor Joe. You know, I'm glad he found a different job though. Same. Stood up for himself. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad he didn't have to go in that basement again. Same. I'm telling you, and I'm telling you, I I know I talk about basements a lot. <laughs> I will never live in a place that has a basement. Never. My current building that I, my day job is in, is in Old Boise. And I think the building that my office is in, it was built in like 1891 or something. It's the oldest part of Boise where I work. And there is a basement in this building. And I have never been in the basement. And not only do I work there, but my mother worked in this building for like 30 years. And I never went in the basement. But also, if it was haunted, your mom would be like, "Mm, I don't know. I'm not a ghost. So I don't care. I'm not a ghost. So I do not care. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so the house I grew up in Boise was built in 1909. And it was actually the first governor's mansion in Boise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Governor Haynes lived there. And when my mom would send me into that basement for whatever, or I had to go get something, there was, so you go down the yes. stairs, there was a room to the right. Yes. And my dad kind of had this tool thing set up and there was another room in there and yeah. that was his gun room. Then there was this room for canned goods and it had a yes. locked door. Yes. That was the worst. I hated that room. And then mm-hmm. when you came out, there was, I, f- I found as I got older, there was a door that was blocked off to nowhere. Uh, I've never, uh, ever been in there. That's creepy. Isn't it? I, I, yeah, no, I think I blocked out a lot of stuff about the basement because it used to scare me so bad when I was a kid. But it's also, be, it's not like it's a big open basement. It's like closed off areas and little rooms in the basement. So it's not like you could see everything. There are corners that you can't see around. And on the other side, yeah, past my dad's giant poster of Kramer. (laughs) Forgot about Kramer. (laughs) Oh, Alan. So just past that (laughs) was... The crawl space that went underneath the front porch. And I never went in there either. It just terrified me. I'm certain yeah. there were skeletons under there. But it's something to look into and maybe I'll go yeah. research that a little bit. But ugh. no thanks. Um, speaking of stains real quick, do you remember, Kate, it's like that stain that was outside of the seminary building by your house? Mm-mm. So on the same block as Camden's parents' old house. There was a building, and I think it was, like, for Mormon students yes. to, like, go during school. Your okay. people. My tribe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a stain on the building or on the ground outside of the building, and we used to play games going around it. And I remember very distinctly you telling me a story that that stain was blood because some naked guy had gotten stabbed and was trying to get into the building oh oh and that was his blood okay all right well here's the thing i was so mean to you (laughs) i have always been this creepy little weirdo that was obsessed with spooky and whitney was like oh i like horses and like just um, (laughs) you know life and sunshine and anyway so yeah of course i told you but there is an actual story about I don't know how old I was, but my sister and I were upstairs playing in that big sunroom that was next to mm-hmm. my bedroom. Yeah. And my mom was sitting in the living room, and there was a, a window that was behind her chair that led to the front door from outside, the side the side yeah. door. 
and she saw a shadow coming up to the front, to that door one day. And she Mm -hmm. wasn't expecting anybody. So she went around the corner and there was this man standing in the doorway with his hands around the inside of the door frame. He was naked and covered in blood. See, this is way, way fucking scarier than some random dude trying to get into the seminary building. You should have told me this story. Well, these could be two <laughs> separate stories. I don't I don't even know. I was not nice to you, apparently. I really like to scare you. But anyway, she came around the corner and he ran off and the police came and turned out he was under the influence of some kind of narcotic and had been running through uh-huh. bushes. That's why he was bloody. But there was blood all over the doors of our house. How creepy. How terrifying. Lock your doors, people. So terrifying. Anita Elaine. Um, when I worked at St. Al's, I had to work in the ER one night. I got floated down there. And it was a full moon. I don't remember if it was Halloween, but I know it was a full moon. And we had a guy come in who was totally naked and covered in scratches and said he had been attacked by a werewolf. And it turns out that someone had seen him rolling around in the bushes outside of the hospital. <laughs> you don't know. There could have been a werewolf somewhere. It was a werewolf made out of a bush. Anyway, <laughs> people, <laughs> people be gray. <laughs> Nancy, there's a quote for you. It was a werewolf made out of a bush. <laughs> Do you know that uh, all animals can sense paranormal activity around them, but it is always, always cats who can actually see a ghost. So if your cat is staring at the air. I think cats are like of the, like, I love a cat, but I think cats are like cousins of of devilry. Yeah, yeah. If your cat is staring in the air, it's time to panic, my friends. You guys always had cats. I I was afraid of them. I don't have any more, but smother me in my sleep i keep seeing orbs coming across your video nobody ever died in this house i checked when i bought it (laughs) (laughs) all right gonna finish up boy do we have an oi to hope for you god yeah so keeping on the the theme of this area of idaho I gotta get serious. This is my oh, Idaho moment. Oh, Idaho. All right. During World War II, the U.S. government, quote, assumed control, a.k.a. stole 3,300 acres of the Fort Hall Reservation that they had forced the Shoshone Bannock tribes on uh, in the mid 1800s and turned it into an air base. Now, the government officials told the indigenous people that they would return their land to them after the war. Now, instead of doing that, the government sold the stolen land that did not belong to them to a nearby town for one dollar. Now, the name of the town? Pocatello. That's correct. They sold the stolen land to a town named after the leader of the tribe that they had displaced, starved, murdered, and eventually forced to live on the garbage land that would not produce crops that they eventually stole again. Oh, I know. One dollar. It's so infuriating and sad and gross. I'm telling you. Vengeful babies. Yeah, so... Should be a thing. Oh, God. (laughs) God, with the babies. So, that's the story of the water babies and some other miscellaneous hauntings of Pocatello or Pocatello, as Siri would say. We hope you enjoyed hanging out with us tonight. (laughs) Uh, well 
if you did like it, or even if you did not, which how could you not have really <laughs> with this last hour of your life spent with us, please like and follow. It would mean the world to us. You can find us on Instagram at Ghosts and Garnets Podcast and on Facebook at Ghosts and Garnets Murder in Idaho. Murder. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time, and have a happy and safe Halloween. Happy Halloween. Thank you.